I better did know the repugnant dark history behind Devonos and Lady Musgrave Road in Kingston, Jamaica. So there is a distasteful dark history behind the famous Devonos and Lady Musgrave Road in Kingston, Jamaica that I bet most of you Jamaicans never know about. Let me shed some light on it. Now, when this man built him mansion, Devon House, you have one look at all white <laughs> man will live up the road with name Lady Lucinda Musgrave. Now, Lady Lucinda Musgrave was the wife of the then governor of Jamaica, Lord Anthony Musgrave. Now, Lady Lucinda Musgrave usually drive past Devon House on a daily basis. This never sit well with her, knowing that a black man own that big of a mansion. Bigger than probably for us, that's why she da complain. So she start nag her husband about the man house. I cannot be driving past this man house on a daily basis. It kills me. I'm your wife, you gotta do something about it. She start get envious. Bad mind start turn up in her. And she never stop ninging ning at the man years until one day Mr. Musgrave take up the phone and say, yo, call him contractor and say, Mr. Contractor, yeah, man, I'm, I'm Lord Anthony Musgrave, you know, the governor. So you me I beg you, you know, why you build me a road so that my wife can avoid driving past Devon Because she keep on a complain, a complain, a complain, and I can't take it no more. Please, build a road. I want you to call it Lady Musgrave Road. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, that was how Lady Musgrave Road come into existence. Out of jealousy, bad mind, envy, all of them put together. If you never know, now you know. In Jamaica, there is a famous Devon House, a historical landmark popular for its patties and the famous Devon House Ice Cream and Bakery. On any given weekend, when the weather is suitable, it also serves as a public park for families. There's a popular story that involves Devon House that most Jamaicans grew up hearing. Basically, the story goes that Lady Musgrave, the wife of the then governor of Jamaica, was so angry at seeing Devon House, this grand mansion owned by a black man, that she authorized the building of another road to avoid driving past it. The story says that this is the reason why the road is known today as Lady Musgrave's Road. However, as much as the story is popular and accepted by Jamaicans, it's simply not true. In this episode of Lest We Forget, we entirely debunk the myth that is the story of Lady Musgrave and Devon House's owner, George Stiebel. Devon House was built by George Stiebel in 1881. His obituary was published in the Gleaner on July 4, 1895. The write-up states that Stiebel was born in humble beginnings before embarking on a life of carpentry. After this brief stint in his life, he started a small trading business between Jamaica and areas off the American coast. Soon after, he became involved in gold mining and an opportunity arose where he acquired shares in a mining property in Central America. He invested all his money into the endeavor, and for a moment it seemed that the investment was unsuccessful. His partner thought so too. He gave up on the investment and sold all his shares to Stiebel. But the investment would eventually bear fruit, and Stiebel took the monies from that investment to invest in more gold mines. And soon after, he amassed a vast fortune. So after 15 years away, George Stiebel returned to the island with his fortune and his new status as a Jamaican's first black millionaire. 
Upon his return to Jamaica, he served as a member of the Board of Education and a gas commissioner. He also did a stint as a director of the Jamaica Cooperative Fruit Insurance Company and the Jamaica Permanent Benefit Society and the Kingston Sailors Home. He was the chairman of the St. Andrews Parochial Board and the St. Andrews Poor House. He also served as a custos of St. Andrew. He also loaned £5,000 with a guaranteed £1,000 to the proposed 1891 Jamaica Exhibition, which was intended to promote the island via tourism. So it's clear that this man was doing big things with his big bag. One of the key things he did when he returned to Jamaica was to purchase property. He purchased multiple properties, including a mountain retreat called Minyard near Brownstone, St. Anne. He also bought property for the place which would become his primary residence, Devon House in St. Andrew. Devon House is situated on Devon Penn. The earliest record of the area that we found dates back to 1667, when 60 acres of land was awarded to Reverend Sellers by King Charles II. Today, that 600 acres of land stretches from the St. Andrew Parish Church north to Sandy Gully. It includes Old Church Road and King's House, and to the south, it borders Trafalgar Pen, which is now the address of the British High Commission. In 1750, the St. Andrew Parish Church built a rectory and stayed there for the next 128 years. In 1881, George Stiebel purchased that rectory and built his mansion, Devon House. By the time the house was completed, the crossroad where it was situated became known as the Millionaire's Corner. The corner got its name because at that time, there were three dazzling private homes in the area that were built by three millionaires, George Stiebel, Louis Verley, and Daniel Finzi. Today, Devon House is the last surviving home of these three private residences. Louise Verley's private residence is now replaced by the Abbey Court Apartments, and Daniel Finzi's home is where the YMC now stands. Still, in the late 1800s Jamaica, Devon House was a sight to see. Covering almost 53 acres of land, and apart from the two-story mansion, the property also featured a carriage house, a pool, a tennis court, and a blacksmith shop and to actualize Stiebel's immense love for horses, a race course. Staff quarters were also on the property to house the many operative staff around the estate. With this house, George Stiebel was able to consolidate his status as one of the most important persons in Jamaica by 1881. And the list of important people in Jamaica was the list to be on. I mean, it had the governor of Jamaica, Sir Anthony Musgrave on it, so that should tell you. So let's talk about the Musgraves. Sir Anthony Musgrave served as governor of Jamaica from 1877 to 1883. Before coming to the island, he served as governor in various parts of the British Empire. Antigua, Nevis, St. Vincent, Newfoundland, British Columbia, Natal, and South Australia. Then, like most governors of British territories, when Governor Musgrave came to Jamaica, he brought with him his wife, American-born Lady Jeannie Lucinda Musgrave. Now, with that backstory out of the way, we can address the myth about the origins of the name of the Lady Musgrave Road. A January 15, 2016 post by the National Library of Jamaica's Facebook page states, Did you know Lady Musgrave Road, St. Andrew, was named after Jean Lucinda Musgrave? She was the wife of Sir Anthony Musgrave, who was governor of Jamaica from 1877 to 1883. It is also rumored that George Stiebel's wealth made Lady Musgrave very uncomfortable as she took strong offense having to pass his Devon house. She was reportedly offended that a black man had managed to build such a prominent house in close proximity to the governor's residence. To address this issue, a road was built at her request to bypass Hope Road. Conveniently, this post by the National Library of Jamaica the institution that is responsible for the collection and preservation of historical records of the island, followed up in a separate post with, Thank you all for still keeping posted to the NLJ's page. We had hoped that by using the word rumoured, it would show that no proof has yet been found. We felt that a highlight of the road could not be done without mentioning the popular belief around it. 
With that being said, the Yard will provide the necessary evidence to show that despite this widely popular tale being repeated by many people, including citizens, academics, journalists, the National Library of Jamaica, and other government institutions, the story of Lady Musgrave and Devon House is simply not true. As stated by the National Library of Jamaica, there is no evidence at all that Lady Musgrave ordered the construction of the road to avoid seeing Stiebel's private residence. No written evidence at all at the institution. Furthermore, there exists no road approval records in the Jamaica archives during Musgrave's time on the island, that is, between 1877 and 1883. No records that we could find at least. Nothing that shows that an order was made for the construction of the road we know today as Lady Musgrave Road. What does exist, however, is the documentation that the road that is today Lady Musgrave Road existed before the Musgraves came to Jamaica and subsequently existed before the Devon House was built in 1881. One article in particular, published in the Kingston Gleaner on Thursday, February 7, 1878, states... A large flag was extended across the junction, which leads to Stony Hill and to King's House, to form a square arch, attached with coconut bows, roses, etc. To the sides were attached two flags, red, white, and blue. In the middle of the large one was a blue attached, with the words, Welcome, Sir Anthony Musgrave. Now the junction which leads from Stony Hill to King's House is indeed the road we know today as Lady Musgraves Road. And since the article mentioned that a flag was placed across this road to welcome the Musgraves, the road existed before they even came to the island. Furthermore, this article was published in 1878, three years before Devon House was built in 1881. So Lady Musgrave Road was built and used before the construction of George Steeple's residence. Other articles published in the Gleaner prior to 1881 also mentioned the existence of the road now known as Lady Musgrave. Now, we would love to share them with you, our listeners. However, since one copy of the archival Gleaner newspaper costs us $1,586, and given our budget, or better yet, or lack thereof, the above article is the only one we could afford in a clear, readable manner. So with all this being said, clearly... Lady Musgrave did not order a road to be built to avoid Mr. Stiebel's home. Now there's still the question of the origins of the road name since the road is today known as Lady Musgrave Road. The first mention of Lady Musgrave Road that we could find was in a building site announcement published in the Daily Gleaner on November 18, 1905. It states, Frontage on the Lady Musgrave Road in St. Andrew, as per diagram annexed to the Certificate of Title under the Registration of Titles Law. Please apply to M. Delgado, 5 Port Royal Street, Kingston. As such, we can firmly state that this junction came to be Lady Musgrave Road sometime in the early 1900s. The documentation shares that the road was renamed in honor of Lady Musgrave for her philanthropic work during her stay in Jamaica. During her stint as a governor's wife, Lady Musgrave founded the Lady Musgrave Women's Self-Help Society on November 1, 1879. Located at Church Street, the society was the first of its kind in Jamaica, where its mission was to promote the arts and crafts made by women on the island. A copy of the society's 25th annual report published in 1904 states, the Lady Musgrave Women's Self-Help Society, popularly known by the shorter title of the Women's Self-Help Society, has been established for the purpose of 1. Enabling industrious women of all classes to keep themselves and others by providing a sale room for all kinds of work, especially the small industries peculiar to Ireland, such as work in ferns, lace, bark, dagger, etc. 2. Raising the standard of work by subjecting the articles deposited for sale to criticism of cultivated taste. 3. Providing a competent teacher to instruct girls in plain needlework of a high class. 4. Supplying materials to necessitous needlewomen to be made up into article of clothing for sale. One thing we can say for sure is that what Lady Musgrave actually hated in Kingston was the lack of beautification efforts by the state. 
In an August 14, 1896 article published in the Daily Gleaner titled Kingston Horticultural Society Annual Meeting, the report from the meeting note states, Mr. Gall thought they owed a great deal to the Botanical Department and Lady Musgrave for the wonderful change that has been brought about in this country in the growth and cultivation of flowers. When he came here first 45 years ago, there were only two rose trees in Kingston, one on East Queen Street and the other in the vicinity of Barnes Gully. He was pleased to see the great advances that had been done since. So where did the infamous story about the origin of Lady Musgrave Road come from? The story of Lady Musgrave being outraged by George Siebel's wealth, by all documentation available, was first told by a person named Nienpan Tarpido. On August 29, 1988, in an article titled Lady Musgrave Road, Born Out of Hatred and Envy, published in the Daily Gleaner, Tarpido stated, Lady Musgrave, wife of Governor Andrew Musgrave, was en route to Crossroads a couple of months after their arrival from England when she observed Devon House, the finest piece of architecture in Kingston in the 1800s. She inquired as to whose house it was and was told that it belonged to Mr. George Steeble, CMG, former custos of the parish of St. Andrew and chairman of parochial board. During those days, in order to get to Crossroads, one would have to travel by way of Hope Road onto Halfway Tree. It was said she could not accept to pass by a black man's house standing so beautifully in the middle of Kingston. Lady Musgrave was said to be surprised and angry because the finest house in Kingston at the time belonged to a black man. Sources close to the family revealed that Lady Musgrave became uneasy and could not believe that a black man could be living in a house much more beautiful than King's house. Upon returning to King's house, it was said that she told the governor she would not travel to Crossroads by way of Hope Road because she could not cope with the reality that a black man was living in more luxury than they were. The governor, having been convinced that his wife would not go to Crossroads, after insisting that the house did not mean anything, decided to build a road that would run from King's House to join with Old Hope Road leading to Crossroads. The road was constructed and named after Lady Musgrave. Sources said that she was pleased but always thought about Devon House. Mr. Siebel saw the construction of the road as development and was also said to be pleased about the governor's decision to open up new roads, thereby creating easy access to crossroads for others. Now based on the aforementioned facts, it's clear that the article is not historically correct, because the Musgraves came to Jamaica almost three years before the construction of Devon House. So Lady Musgrave could not have seen Devon House a few months after her arrival to the island. Secondly, the road in question that the author mentioned the one that Governor Musgrave allegedly ordered to be constructed to avoid Devon House already existed. So if she wanted to avoid Devon House, she could have just taken the road that was already there. Why would anyone order the construction of something that already existed? Thirdly, Tarpon Doe provided no direct sources. His references came from sources said, sources close to family, and it was said. So as you hear on this episode, we fact-checked. Tarpedo's tale of the story behind Lady Musgrave isn't true. It's as simple as that. Still, the story of Lady Musgrave and her apparent intense hatred of George Steeble is one of many myths that Jamaicans have passed on as facts. Another myth that exists is around the White Witch of Rosal, Annie Palmer. The woman who Annie Palmer is based on never practiced any form of witchcraft, nor was she buried on the Rose Hall compound. Nevertheless, a story of a memorial taking place on the Rose Hall estate in St. James in 1830 eventually found its way to H.G. Delissa, the former editor of the Gleaner Company. With this memorial serving as his inspiration, Delissa wrote his famous novel, The White Witch of Rose Hall. In his 1929 publication, he tells the tale of Annie Palmer, a white woman known for using witchcraft to woo lovers to her bed and control the black enslaved population on her plantation. As Delissa's novel tells the story, a love triangle developed between Annie, an Englishman named Rutherford, and Millicent, a free mulatto woman. The Englishman ended his relationship with Annie, but showed interest in Millicent, 
And so, Annie cursed her and she died. The climax of the book comes when Annie is killed by an enslaved man, Taku. Taku would lead the charge of a rebellion, which given the setting of the book, would have to be the 1831 Christmas Rebellion. The book ends with Taku being murdered by Annie's white overseer and former lover, Ashman, thus bringing an end to the rebellion. But just by his fictionalizing of the events of the Christmas Rebellion and the memorial on the estate, Delissa, who through his editorials advocated for Jamaica's business class while opposing black working class political and economic power, used his novels to further propel his views on Jamaican society. In his paper, An Act of Unruly Savagery, rewriting black rebellion in the language of the colonizer, H.G. Delissa's The White Witch of Rose Hall, academic and poet Kwame S. N. Dows said this about Delissa's most famous novel. The murder of the white woman by black slaves reinforces the traditional white paranoia about the masculine male destroying their white people. The white male will seek to bring order to the society after the chaos. The black rebel through ignorance and will therefore be subjected to harsh justice for their illegal acts of rebellion. And it shouldn't be lost on you or listeners that Delissa reduces the largest slave uprising in the British West Indies to a love triangle. The theme of reducing political organizing of oppressed Jamaicans to love triangles where an oppressed race woman falls in love with a white man and has society face terrible consequences because of that love is prevalent in Delissa's other novels. In The Arawak Girl, the daughter of an Arawak chief falls in love with Christopher Columbus's second in command. In The White Maroon, a love triangle took place just like the one in The White Witch. The difference? This was set in 1655, during the English conquest of Jamaica, and the lovers were a Spanish man, an indentured woman, and a jealous Spanish woman. In Morgan's Daughter, Delissa reduces the Tacky Rebellion of 1760 to a love story between Henry Morgan's mixed-race daughter and an Englishman posing as Three-Fingered Jack. In Revenge, he spun his own version of the Morant Bay Rebellion, where his novel follows the romance between Paul Bogle's daughter and a white plantation owner. In The Cup and the Lip, he did a take on the indentureship history of Jamaica, and yes, this follows the relationship between an Indian woman and a white man. And in Hunted, published in Volume 4 of Planter's Punch, he reduces Jamaica's 1938 labor uprising to an epic romance involving Obia. English literature academic Dr. Leanne Rosenberg, in her book Nationalism and the Formation of Caribbean Literature, sums up Delisser's literary troupe. Delisser employed the romance plot to promote the image of the emergent elite by depicting Afro Caribbean rebellions not as a result of large scale organization, but rather consequences of actions taken by his heroines in their very personal struggles to secure the love of white men. Over his 40 years as editor of the Gleaner newspaper from 1904 to 1944, Delissa was without a doubt one of the most influential people in Jamaican print media, national literature, and political debate. As such, anything he said would likely have swayed public opinion and be accepted as facts. And that is how the famous story of Annie Palmer, despite being fiction, entered Jamaican society as truth and took on a life of its own. And what a life that story has had, for in recent years, we have seen the legend of Annie Palmer turned into a play, spotlighted on multiple paranormal TV shows, featured on a US modeling reality contest, and celebrated as a feminist icon on the world stage by a Jamaican beauty queen. And thanks to Delissa's story, the Rose Hall Great House is today a major tourist attraction. Local and international tourists are eager to tour the former plantation to hear about Annie Palmer and witness her ghost, who, the tour guides will tell you, still haunts the place today. Mind you, all of this is based on events that never happened and a woman who was not buried on the property. Still, the story of Lady Musgrave Road and the Rose Hall Great House, despite being false, reinforces our relationships with the landscape around us. So when someone mentions Lady Musgrave Road, they will mention Lady Musgrave's hatred of seeing a black man's wealth and demanding a new road to be built to avoid it. 
It's also quite difficult to mention the Rose Hall Great House and not speak about Annie Palmer. It's this relationship that Jamaican landscape historian professor of history at the University of the West Indies Mona, Dr. Carl Watts, expounded upon when we sought his expertise while researching this episode. Okay. All right. My name is Carl Watts, historian um, in the Department of History and Archaeology, UWE Mona, UWE Mona campus, sorry. And yeah, I was asked today to come and um, to confirm or to, to put to bed some of the myths surrounding Lady Musgrave Road. Um, we do, all right, let us, let's face it, all right, let me not be too um, dismissive of the story because, let's face it, within the context of landscape history, um, these stories, false or not, these are one. These are examples of how people reinforce or or identify with spaces, right? It falls it falls under the, the um under the heading, for instance, of landscape and ideology, where people use these forms of aesthetic expressions to reinforce that relationship with the land, right? And we have several examples of it, for instance. Look at the association with the great house in Rose Hall, right? Many people actually believe that there was a white witch of, 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 the, Rose, of the Rose Hall great house, Annie Palmer, when in fact this is very, um, this couldn't be further from the truth. She was actually a very, um, she was, you know, she had no association with any form of witchcraft. She was actually, she wasn't even in Rose Hall at the time these stories started to circulate, right? She wasn't even buried on the compound. Right, but I guess the association, I don't know where it emerged. Maybe it could have been something as simple as the house being abandoned, right? So they might say, wait, why is this place like that? It's haunted. There must be some story associated with it. And then this became reinforced with the book that was published by Herbert Delisa, The White Witch of Rosal, and everybody ran with that narrative. And it, it literally became fact over the years. It was it was hardly challenged, right? Well, some would have challenged it, but the popular trend or the popular narrative would have been um, embraced by the people. Similar with Lady Musgrave Road. We know that this lady um, would have... All right, so Devon House would have been one of, the, one of the prominent properties in Kingston and St. Andrew at the time, right? All right, the road networks, maybe, I'm not saying, uh, because this is clearly another narrative that has extended for maybe close to a century, I'm assuming. But the, the narrative, I mean, sorry, the landscape, the development of the road network at the time, I'm not saying this is the case. This has not been confirmed. But let's face it. The area where Lady Musgrave Road is now would not have been as developed, right? The road would have been there, but the road would not have been catering to, for instance, vehicles or motor vehicle traffic, for instance, big carriages and so on. So the, the spaces would have been much narrower. Um, there wouldn't have been any what do you call it um the road work wouldn't have been as expanded so maybe they saw some works taking place to expand the road network you know to maybe to encourage more carriages to pass through and they'd probably I'd just assume well um well yeah so she's the one who had, she wants it built because or she wants the road work to be extended because she doesn't want to buy um, to pass Devon House. So um where the, the records clearly say that the road existed before um, Lady Musgrave and her husband, obviously, Governor Anthony Musgrave, became were present in the island for a couple of years. And, um, yeah, and I guess the narrative is there, you know, but the one thing I saw in the Jamaica Almanac, let's, let's actually give Lady Musgrave some credit, you know. Um, it is, you know, she did have a self-help society, that she founded in 1879 to develop local industries and provide employment uh, by self-help to poor craftswomen. Um, this institution or, organi or establishment went into decline quickly, after, especially after she left. But, you know, there is just no indication that she... There's no indication that she... She took part in any slight of George Tibel at, at Devon House. But I do understand the narrative, historically speaking. These narratives are part of 
the Jamaican tradition, the tra Jamaican culture. And it's part of the historiography. You have to reckon with it because of the association with the popular narratives that circulate or that have circulated since the 19th century. Even before, obviously, we know of the Golden Table. We know of the Spanish having treasure buried all over Jamaica, especially under the big trees. We know about, uh, what's the other one? Um, the, 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 this, the, the, the pond in, in Yalas, St. Thomas, being, um, when, it be, when it became red, it was associated with a, a feud, a blood feud between brothers. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, these narratives do circulate um, popular, in the popular narrative, well, these popular narratives do circulate, but clearly, historically, if you want to be the, the, the party pooper, the one who has to burst the bubble, these stories are not factual. But they have helped people to identify. So let's, let's, let's look at the, the positive of this story. So, all right, she wanted to bypass um, Lady Musgrave Road. But what did, it, what did that story do in the eyes of the people who were telling this story? It would have elevated Devon House, um, elevated the, the, the house that was built by the first black millionaire in Jamaica. It would have elevated his standing in their minds by having a story like this circulate even though it would have not been sensible for a woman of her stature um, to bypass this man, it would look a bit foolish on her part if she was to do something like that. But, yeah. So back to George Stiebel's Devon House. After George Stiebel's death in 1896, the house had an interesting history. By 1923, it was sold to Reginald Milado, a successful entrepreneur. A portion of the property was subdivided to create what we know today as Waterloo and Devon Roads. In 1928, it was sold to Cecil Lindo, who, at the time, also purchased J. Ray and Nephew and Money Musk Estate. In 1960, the house was in the position of Cecil's widow, Agnes Lindo, but she eventually moved to New York and the house was left vacant. Still, when news got out that there were plans to demolish the property, the then Minister of Welfare and Development of Jamaica, Edward Siaga, placed a restriction order on the property under the National Trust Act. This ceased the demolition of the mansion. And so it happened that in 1965, the government of Jamaica purchased the property. In the 1970s, members of the Rastafari community occupied the property. But in 1974, Prime Minister Michael Manley opened Devon House as the National Gallery. Almost a decade later, in 1982, the house was refurbished, where it was opened by Queen Elizabeth II. In 1990, Devon House was made a national monument, thus beginning its contemporary tradition as one of the most popular public parks in Jamaica. And thanks to its famous food establishments on the property, including Devon House Ice Cream and Devon House Bakery, the property became Jamaica's first gastronomy center. Nevertheless, since Nine Pan Tarpedo's 1988 Lena article, there have been multiple pleas in traditional and social media for the renaming of Lady Musgrave Road. And this is a valid point, the renaming of some of Jamaica's roads. In fact, in the article Vendors Want Purge of Colonial Era Street Names in Kingston, published in the Jamaica Gleaner on March 22, 2022, street vendors in downtown Kingston call for the renaming of some of the roads in the vicinity. As Lincoln Jimmy King, a vendor who sells pet fish at the intersection of King and Tower Street said, Should I have one Nanny Street, Paul Bogle Street, Louise Bennett Street and them where they did, yeah man. Then a few months later, on October 26, 2022, Minister of State in the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sports, Alanda Terrellong said this in regard to Jamaica becoming a republic. As a republic, it would be a fitting tribute to our cultural heroes to rename some of the roads in Kingston and across Jamaica in their honor. Roads that were named to revere the British monarchy, such as King Street, East and West Queen Street, Duke Street, Princess Street, must be renamed to pay homage to our cultural giants who have made Jamaica a global cultural powerhouse and Kingston a UNESCO creative city of music. So in years to come, as Jamaica moves to change its political status, we expect to see even more calls for the renaming of the island's roads, including Lady Musgrave. 
But what we want to drive home is that there's a very strong argument for renaming a road, honoring a woman who was a part of the island's colonial history. Because don't get us wrong, we're not saying that a white woman living in colonial Jamaica, who happens to be the wife of the most powerful man on the island, did not have racist tendencies. That's not what we're saying. This is the 1800s Caribbean after all. The argument that won't work though, is that they should rename the road because Lady Musgrave did not want to see George Steeple's Devon House mansion, so she built a separate road to avoid seeing it. History tells us that's not true. The story of Lady Musgrave hating George Steeple, owner of Devon House and Jamaica's first millionaire, so much so that she built a road to avoid him, is false. And it is for that reason that every petition, every debate, and every letter to the editor in the island's newspapers has been unsuccessful. And that is that. And with that, we call an end to today's episode. To view the sources used in this episode and our recommendations to learn more about the topic, visit our website at tenementyardmedia.com. A transcript of this episode will be available five days after it has been posted to podcast outlets. And remember, this is a conversation we really want to hear from you. Follow our social media pages at tenementyard underscore on both Instagram and Twitter to view additional postings on this episode and updates on other content created by Tenement Yard Media. We're open to conversation about this and other episodes and really all happenings around Caribbean history and culture. Just a quick note before we leave... We're over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tenementyardmedia if you would like to support the show with a monthly donation of as little as $1. You can also make a donation of your choice at tenementyardmedia.com. Until next time, I'm your host Gabrielle and this has been Lest We Forget, a historical podcast from Tenement Yard Media. What good? <laughs>